Well, Happy New Year. Today, uh, the Ultra Wellness Group is going to discuss what the health. Um, for those of you who have seen it, it is a um, pretty interesting documentary. And for those of you who have not, you get a chance to check it out. It actually is um, worth looking at. The reason why I am doing a video on it is because I believe that there is some information that may be a little confusing. And unfortunately, that is the problem sometimes with the Internet. There's a lot of information out here, but sometimes it can be presented in a way by some people that is confusing. And then sometimes you'll find some information about a subject matter a particular subject matter and then there'll be two or three different philosophies and, and some stuff that may sometimes be a little um, in disagreement with other aspects and other um, philosophies on that same subject. So today we're going to deal with what the health and the vegan lifestyle. Let's start with prayer. In the name of the God we serve, who we may call by many names, we beseech thy help and we ask thy mercy for we believe in you and trust in you for all that we need. We help us in your cause with your apostles, so please grant us success. We humbly submit this prayer in, name of, in your name. Amen. So let's get started first by um, saying that the vegan lifestyle was coined by a man who is an animal rights activist, meaning that he was interested in protecting animals and didn't want animals to be harmed. So if a person is going to put together a lifestyle dietary plan, meaning that you're going to try to eat the right type of foods to keep your health, yourself healthy, vibrant, and also if your plan is to look at living for a long time or longevity, I would disagree that that's a good motive using animal rights as a plan to produce a dietary plan. A dietary plan should be based on what are the needs of the human body. And so most of us know, of course, that we need vitamins. We need macronutrients. Macronutrients are the large things that we get from breaking down our food. So that would be fat, sugar, protein. And then you have micronutrients, which are all of the elements that are on a periodic table. So when you look at a periodic table, there are 118 different elements on there that include sodium, oxygen, iodine, potassium, manganese, zinc. All of those are your micronutrients. So when we're trying to put together a lifestyle, eating pattern that is going to give us longevity, give us good health, and if we're sick, help us help us heal, then that has to be done by looking at those different categories of substances that we need to bring into the body and say, okay, what foods have these things? And uh, I, I, I missed uh, vitamins, so also vitamins. So again, you have your macronutrients, your micronutrients, and your vitamins. The other things that are very important to the body and its um, good health and longevity is, of course, water and oxygen. So if you take those five different categories, you would have to say, okay, I need something that's going to give me these things that I need in order to have this body work correctly. So that's why I use the word foolish when it comes to that man Watson and him starting a vegan lifestyle based on the fact that he wanted to protect animals because that doesn't make any sense to me that somebody would say, okay, I'm going to put together an eating lifestyle, but it's because I don't want to injure animals. No, you have to put together a lifestyle plan based on what is it that the body needs? Where is it that I can find what the body needs? And then the, in the area that I live in the region of the world that I live, what are the best sources of those nutrients, of those substances that I need to have a, a healthy life. So I wanted to preface the, the discussion of what the health with that. Vegan lifestyle 
is not what I would suggest people follow. Now, I say that because What the Health is basically a documentary promoting the vegan lifestyle. And unfortunately, these type of documentaries and these type of ideologies are impressive to people. And it's impressive because people are looking for something different, something new. People are looking for something because they don't feel good. They don't have enough energy. You're overweight. You're sick. You're going to these doctors. You have all these different medicines and these medications. And people are in a desperate place because of that. And so the Internet can be a benefit. It can be a wonderful tool. It can be a, a great place to go and access information, but it also is a place where you can go and get information that may not necessarily be good, and people are doing it in the name of making money and selling products and things of that nature. And so I pray that that's where I come in is to help empower people, not to follow me, but to listen to some of the things I say and then use that intellect and that problem solving skills that you've learned over the years and look at the reality of how the body works and then some of these things that are out here on the on the market and come to a conclusion on how you are going to make your health the best so just to to begin um there were a number of physicians in this um in this uh documentary give me a second I've got to grab something. And so I will just say that the majority of the doctors that were on this documentary, I have been reading and um, have had some interactions with them over the years. The first one that I'll mention is Charles Ezelstein, and that was the cardiologist that was talking about reversing heart disease. I read his book years ago. Very good book. I, I had had an experience with a lady who completely reversed her heart disease completely and the doctors that were taking care of her thought it was a miracle charles edelstein's book is a good book because it talks about how a different lifestyle can improve your heart but he has a section in the end of his book that was talking about um menus and certain type of foods that he was suggesting for people to eat and that's where i had a difference with him because he was promoting soy dishes he was promoting still having some people eating some meat and you know of course i don't ever tell people that you just stop doing what you're doing automatically it is a process in, in the way that you go in a direction of developing a lifestyle if you have one already and it obviously is not giving you the type of results that you need so that's, I think, where, where I will make most of my points is, is the suggestions that some of these people are making, and, and we have to have a way to evaluate those. The other doctor that I've had a lot of experience with would be Dr. Neil Barnhart. He's with this group called PCRM, Physicians for Responsible Medicine, and he's done a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of, um, has produced a lot of testimonies on people that have had improvement in their lifestyle based on changing their lifestyle and changing their eating habits. Now, um, the thing that I think that we have to be careful when you look at a documentary like this is they had two patients that they used as examples. They had this man who had diabetes as well as other medical problems. He was on insulin, high blood pressure medications, and diabetes medications. And then there was a lady who was very arthritic and was headed to getting hip replacement surgeries. And both of these people seemed to have great improvement within just two weeks. Now that's been my experience as well. People within two to three weeks that are in very, very bad condition have great signs that what they are doing is going to produce some serious improvements. 
I've seen people with horrible heart disease, hepatitis, HIV, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, arthritis. In two to three weeks, these people are convinced that what they are doing is completely and totally put it, has put them on a journey where they realize that they're going to get rid of their problems. But I also believe that that's where sometimes we can get ourselves in trouble. Because if you have a medical problem, or if you're overweight, or if you're just looking to start a lifestyle where you want not to have these negative things happen to you in the future, then we have to make sure that we're evaluating the information that we get to see what it looks like long term. So from that perspective, the oldest person that I know of in the vegan lifestyle was Jack LaLanne. I was going to put some pictures up, but for some reason I can't, I don't see the link to do it. But anyway, um, Jack LaLanne was a, uh, like this health guru in the forties and the fifties. He was about, you know, working out and staying fit and all these type of things. He was probably the most popular person that was talking about getting off of meat and eating more vegetables and eating more fruits and having more of a physical active lifestyle. He used to swim across like rivers and, you know, do all kind of public stuff. And he was very popular when it came to that, but he died in 99. That's not a lot. That's not a long life. And that is where I challenge all of you that you have to do your research. Some of these documentaries give you some, some wonderful information, but we can't just take it at face value as I, I expect you all to not take what I say at face value either. Do the research and, and check what I'm saying. Because in the vegan lifestyle, they believe in eating raw vegetables. They believe in eating green leafy vegetables and they believe in eating nuts. And I would say that all three of those are mistakes. So prior to getting into that, let me talk about the fact that there are some benefits that you can get with changing to a vegan lifestyle. But where did you start? If I'm a, 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 an, an excessive meat eater, if I'm eating a lot of junk food, if I eat a lot of fast food, I'm at McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King and all these type of places, pizza, all these type of things on a regular basis, then going from that to a vegan lifestyle is going to give you a lot of change. It will give you benefits. If you are the type of person that has never really had any particular way to eat, you grew up eating soul food or whatever it is what the family traditions are. Well, when you look at what your family history is and people are sick, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart attacks, strokes, all those type of things, and they don't live very long, 70, 80, and you say, I just want to do something different, you could probably get some benefits with a vegan lifestyle. But I'm suggesting that we should look deeper than just improvement. We have to look to getting longevity. We have to look to what is it, if we are faithful and spiritual people, what does God say about what you should eat? And I think that has to be the basis more than I'm going to follow some other person and what they do. Because if Jack LaLanne is the example of what you're going to get out of a vegan lifestyle, then 99 is not a lot of years. If a person that lives 117, 120 is going to give you a lifestyle, well, hell, they have more success at 117 or 120 than a person who lived at 99. And so you have to do some research. You have to do some self experimentation to see what happens in you so let's first say that you know there there are some disconnects and some different philosophies in the vegan lifestyle there are people in a vegan lifestyle that say fruit is bad for you and i would say that is probably one of the most asinine things i've ever heard fruit is probably the best thing that you can put in your body it's very easily digested. Any of you that have had fruit, when you eat fruit, it almost turns to water when you bite it. So that proves how easy the body can break it down because it's already starting to break down in, into water even in your mouth. The nutrients that you get out of fruit, and let me say this, the foods that I'm suggesting, I'm only talking about organic food. And we shouldn't even have to say that, but in today's climate, 
that is the best of food. You have to buy organic food. Doesn't mean that you have to go to any particular grocery store, but you have to do research in your region of the country. Where is the best food coming from? It has to be organic though. So back to fruit. Fruit, fruit is very easily digested. Fruit has high amounts of nutrients and vitamins and fruits probably have more phytonutrients than any other food food category that we can eat. Phytonutrients being meaning things that we get out of plants that come in the body and start the healing process. So that's what you want to do. Every day we walk out of our house, we breathe, we interact with nature, you bump into a wall or you, you know, whatever happens, there is an aging and an injury process that happens with all of that. So every day we have to be putting something into the body that's going to help repair that. Just like an old house who needs some repairs, some renovations, some things need to be changed. That's what our bodies do on an everyday basis. Fruit is one of the best foods for that. Vegetables are very good. Vegetables have a small amount of protein in them, but they also have phytonutrients and antioxidants. And let me go back just for a second. Antioxidants, fruits are very high in antioxidants. The word oxidant just means oxygenation. So if any of you have ever peeled a banana back, bit a banana, put it down on the counter, or bit an apple and put it down on the counter, come back in a few minutes or sometime later, and that piece of fruit is brown. That is the oxidation process that happens in the human body every day. That's why fruit is so good because it fights that and it keeps the oxidation process from happening. Fruit is helping you stay young. It's helping you not age. So fruit has the highest level of antioxidants and phytonutrients than any other classification of foods. So next would be vegetables. Let me first say that vegetables have to be heated. You cannot eat raw vegetables and get the complete access to all of the nutrients that are in it. There are two substances. And what I will do is I'll put some links and I'll put these words in here so you can come back later and check them out. But two words that you have to notice to know about vegetables and what we call anti-nutrients. The first one is phytic acid. That's P-H-Y-T-I-C. And then the other one is oxalic acid. O-X-A-L-I-C. Oxalic acid and phytic acid. These are two substances that are in vegetables naturally, in nature. The purpose of these two substances are to kind of keep insects and animals at bay. It is a natural process of a kind of a deterrent to certain animals, certain insects, so that they won't eat the food. You get rid of that by heating it, so you have to minimally, ste minimally steam or lightly cook your vegetables before you eat them in order to break down phytic acid, phytic acid and oxalic acid, the heat breaks them down and then allows you to be able to pull the nutrients out of the food. If you eat them raw, you will not get the nutrients out of, out of the food because those two substances block you from getting those nutrients. So that's why raw vegetables does not make any sense. And we're talking about across the whole class. So vegetables have to be steamed or heated. You cannot eat vegetables raw. Now, when it comes to green leafy vegetables, here is what I mean by you have to do your own experimentation. I came up in a family where we ate greens for the holidays. We ate greens for Christmas and Thanksgiving and other type of holidays when there were a lot of family members around. And I remember every time I ate greens, the next day my stool was green, completely green, not a little bit of green completely green. And if you all have had the same experience, you have to ask yourself, well, why was my stool green? If I put a food in my mouth that's green and I chew it, swallow it, and it comes out in the stool green, why is that? And some people may say, well, it's just a chlorophyll and it. it's just going to color your stool. Well, how come that doesn't happen when you eat cabbage? How come that doesn't happen when you eat Brussels sprouts? How come that doesn't happen when you eat green beans? How come that doesn't happen when you eat okra? So no, it's not about the, the chlorophyll 
which is the green coloring and green foods, that's the chlorophyll. It's not because of chlorophyll. It's because you cannot digest green leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables are not digestible, and that's why you see the green stuff in the stool, and that's why you've eaten other green foods that I mentioned. You won't see green stuff in the stool. We can digest some foods, and there's some foods that we can't digest, and you have the ability to look at your body, pay attention, be aware of what's happening in your body, and have the proof of what I'm saying. So just a little something on vegetables from the vegan lifestyle. Now, the vegan lifestyle when it comes to protein, and we have to all understand that we have been raised in a society, this American society that pushes on us that we need meat for our protein. And if you look at the largest animals on the planet Earth, elephant, rhinoceros, they don't eat meat. I can't even think of a larger animal, a land animal than either one of those. So no, it's not true that you have to have meat in order to get your protein. My suggestion is the best source of protein would be navy beans. It's the only bean that has been scientifically studied and the breakdown of that bean as far as protein, sugar, and fat is the same breakup of the human breakdown of the human body into those same fat, protein, and sugar. The other thing about navy beans is that they have a very, very, very high amount of antioxidants. Glut glutathione, which is one of the most powerful antioxidants, is in a high amount in navy beans. Navy beans have been studied to be probably the only food that is able to pull radiation out of the body. So for people that have had chemotherapy and radiation, that's a great food to pull those toxins out of the body. A few years ago when there was that large tsunami and earthquake in Japan, there's a lot of radiation that's in the, in the um, seas and the oceans. A lot of that is getting in the fish. So navy beans is a great food. Navy beans are a great food to eat to pull some of that out of our bodies. Long-term radiation has been studied. They did a lot of experiments on black people back in the 40s and 50s. They were injecting them with radiation so that they could learn what would happen when people are exposed to x-rays and other things like that. Most of that research was done on black people. You'll get some of these stories and some of these books that have been written that's, uh, that some white women and some white men were damaged so bad by the radiation, but the majority of that experimentation was done on black people. It is proven that radiation causes cancer. Radiation causes weakening of your bones and just total deterioration of your system and of course, with all of those things, it leads to early death. So it's very important that when we're looking at suggestions of vegans, they talk about beans as being a good source, but they don't clarify what beans. They just talk about beans in general. And then they talk about nuts being a good place to get your protein. So again, I would say this is another place where you can look at doing your research. I personally have done research on navy beans and my energy level, and I have a, an extreme amount of energy when I eat navy beans, and other foods don't give me near as much energy. So that's a way that you could do it, your own research and say, okay, if these people are suggesting that I eat pinto beans and lima beans and peas and other things like that, well, compare them. Eat lima beans one day, eat kidney beans, or eat red beans, or black beans, and then give yourself a break, and then eat navy beans, and see which one gives you more gas, see which one gives you more energy, see which one seems to digest better, because those are all signs of whether or not a food is good for your system or not, and I would suggest that you all do the same thing with nuts. Nuts and seeds are different. I do believe that pumpkin seeds sunflower seeds and flax seeds are very very nutritional for the body but all the rest i believe are nuts almonds cashews macadamians elephant nuts pecans 
All of those are nuts. Yes, there's a lot of science, so-called scientific research that says that they're good for your heart. Well, I'll just say, get your favorite nut, chew them. And right before you swallow, look in the mirror, look at the size of the nuts in your mouth, and then check your stool over the next couple of days, and you'll see those nuts come out in the toilet looking the same way you swallowed them. And I'll just ask a question. Can a food go in your mouth and then come out in the toilet? Can it go through this digestive system and come out looking the same if it's digestible? Question to consider because the vegan lifestyle and the vegan ideology promotes foods that from my perspective, you cannot digest. Now, here's where my biggest contention with the vegan lifestyle is. It is a known fact that vegans have a problem, just in general, I'm talking about the whole vegan class of people that eat, that whole vegan lifestyle, they have a problem maintaining their vitamin D, they have a problem maintaining their vitamin A, they have a problem maintaining their calcium. These are three common problems in the vegan lifestyle. So if you are looking for a lifestyle that is best for you, your immune system is not going to work well without vitamin D. Vitamin A is very important for your eye health. And then calcium is very important for your not only the workings of your muscle and the beating of your heart, but also your bones. How can you expect to have a good, long, healthy life when as a class of lifestyle, the whole vegan lifestyle, those are very common problems? Not, and, and I must add, it's not just in the vegan lifestyle, but they also have a lot of problems with iron deficiency. So those are, those are, some, those are some signs from the beginning that it's not necessarily the best lifestyle. Now, their problem, of course, is because uh, no animal products. That's what they are trying to stay away from. And so they don't do milk and they don't do um, eggs, which are two good sources of vitamin A, vitamin E, and vitamin D. So let me first mention this about drinking milk. There was a time when I believed in other philosophies where I said, you know, humans don't need to drink milk. Once we stop breastfeeding, we shouldn't drink any milk from any other animal. That is a philosophy of a lot of people out there. But what I will say is that when you put God first and you have your faith as the guiding factor in your life, then you have to take God's word. And there's a scripture in the Quran that says that the milk from a cow is agreeable to the drinker. So I'm going to take God's word before I take other explanations and other philosophies. But beyond just saying that I'm taking it for God's word, let's look at why. First of all, we're living in a time where people are saying that there are not enough nutrients in the soil. So the food that we're eating is nu nutritionally less quality than the food from 50 years ago, the food from 100 years ago. I'm not going to disagree with that. But the first response to that is, well, how do you figure that you're getting it in these supplements then? See, you, you, your body will not work well from synthetic chemicals, synthetic vitamins, synthetic nutrients that they make in the laboratory. Your body works best when you get your nutrients, your vitamins and your macro and micronutrients from sources that God produced. So we're talking about natural, real, whole, dense foods. Now, milk is that. It's almost a whole food. You can get many vitamins from it. You get many amino acids, which is what we do with protein. When we eat protein, we break that down into amino acids. That's what the body absorbs. That's what the body places into the body. That's what the body uses. Milk, you don't have to digest. It's already broken down into amino acids. And so this whole philosophy that the reason why we shouldn't drink milk is because there's lactase in it and we don't even make, I mean, lactose in it. We don't even make lactase. That's true. As a human being, we don't make lactase. But there's lactase in the milk if you get milk from a good source that hasn't been pasteurized and homogenized. 
And so, again, we're talking about another aspect of improving your health, but you have to do some research. When you go out and you buy whole, raw milk, you have to buy the type of milk where you, as the farmer, were these cows allowed to graze. That's the normal positive mind frame that a cow needs to be in in order to produce something that you should put in your body. The second thing is, is your farm organic? Did you use pesticides and herbicides and chemical fertilizers on your farm where these cows were eating? The third thing is, is your milk coming from a cow that was pregnant? And if it was, do you use any hormones to, to extend that pregnancy? And that's what you don't want. You don't want to drink milk from any animals that have been had, that have had hormones injected into them. In typical milk farms, they inject the cow with hormones to act as if, to put the cow's body as if it's in pregnancy. And then they just keep pumping it with steroids so that they keep producing milk. Not even a cow that had a baby. But in a responsible farm, they allow the cow to have that baby, and then they milk that cow, and they don't use any, any um, hormones. That cow will continue to produce milk for quite a while as long as you continue to milk it. That's the type of milk that you want to drink. High in glutathione, as I mentioned before, one of the best antioxidants in the body. High in amino acids, high in vitamins, your B vitamins, a and D. One of the best sources of vitamin D that you can find is raw whole milk. So that needs to be in a diet of a person who is trying to have good health. Good reasons, right? One, God said, drink it. Number two, not hard on the digestive system. Number three, if you do your correct research, high in nutrients with not much digestion. Matter of fact, no digestion just some processing that the body has to do and then absorb it. Next would next thing that the vegan lifestyle would reject would be eggs. Eggs are a good source of protein. Eggs are a good source of vitamin D. Got, eggs are a good source of vitamin A as well as other nutrients. So when we are talking about eggs, you have to also do your research because we don't want to eat eggs from chickens that are eating soy, um, soy foods, soy grains. You want to eat chickens. We're taught that you want a chicken that doesn't eat its own feces. I don't know anybody that's doing that these days, but the best would be a chicken that's not allowed to eat his own feces, but you want a chicken that's allowed to graze normally. They call them free range, but you always want to make sure that you're getting eggs from chickens that weren't allowed to eat soy because when chickens are able to eat soy, the soy byproducts are in the egg yolks. If cows are able to eat soy products, soy grains, there will be soy remnants in that milk. So you don't want to do that. That's not any good for you. Soy is very, very bad, which takes me to the next aspect of why the vegan lifestyle for most vegans is not good because they do a lot of soy as the basis of their proteins. And soy is one of the worst things that you can put in your body. Number one, the majority of the soy in the United States is completely genetically modified. But secondly, it's a phytoestrogen. What does that mean? A plant estrogen, meaning that estrogen, a female's hormone, is going into the human body. You don't need to eat foods that will increase your estrogen levels. You have enough ability to produce your own estrogen as a woman and a man. Yes, men have estrogen. We don't make near as much as a woman, and we shouldn't have that much in our bodies as a woman, but we, men and women make estrogen in our bodies. It's at the right level when your body makes it, not when you put it in from an exogenous perspective. Exogenous means coming from outside of the body, coming from outside of the way it's made normally in the human body. We don't need phytoestrogen in the body. Now, I'm sure some people, as I continue to talk, are like, well, where, where did you get this information from? I got this information from How to Eat to Live by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the best book that I've ever read. It's the only book that I've ever read 
it has a very interesting cover from God in person. So, you know, I, I, I want to make it clear that I didn't start getting into how to eat to live from a religious perspective or a spiritual perspective. I first got into how to eat to live from a medical and a scientific perspective. I was frustrated with the success that I was having in medicine. And when I started reading How to Eat to Live, book one, in the first 30 pages, this man was talking about people curing diabetes and curing chronic medical problems and living a long time, not 80, 90. I'm talking about a long time. He said you could live to a thousand years. He said you could never be sick following some of the things that he was doing. I started experimenting with that because I didn't just believe it off of face value. But as I was experimenting with myself and then experimenting with my patients, I was watching people solve medical problems, diabetes gone, high blood pressure gone, high cholesterol gone. Those three problems right there are easy to solve. You solve those problems, you have no heart disease. You solve those problems, you have no strokes. But then I started seeing people solve more difficult problems multiple sclerosis, hepatitis. As I said earlier, a woman completely reversed her heart disease. The doctors did a angiogram, which is when they put the dye in your vein and they look at the blood vessels of the heart and almost all of her heart vessels were completely clogged. In one year of following how to eat to live, her heart deteriorated all of her old blood vessels and she made completely new blood vessels on her heart. The doctor said it was a miracle. These bodies have such great capacity that we're playing around or doing the wrong things or not doing what we know we should be doing, and we're not getting the benefit that we should be getting. HIV. I mean, I have seen some amazing things happen when people get dedicated and diligent on a plan that can prove you some results. And so that's why I wanted to do this video today. Because this vegan lifestyle is a craze now. This vegan lifestyle is being practiced by a lot of famous people. But unfortunately, most of these famous people aren't doing the research. They don't know to do the research. And so I had to um, watch the documentary what the health because there were so many people out there doing it and so many people out there discussing it and i figured that i had to do a video because i don't want people not to have a source of information to be able to check and balance just like the human body has a lot of checks and balances that it does to maintain good health maintain functioning correctly we have to be able to check and balance the information. There's a lot of information coming over the internet. There's a lot of philosophies out here, but we have to have some way of checking that. So the, the last thing that I wanna discuss is something that I thought What the Health did an excellent job in showing. And that is that some of you put a lot of confidence in organizations or institutions, American Cancer Association, American Medical Association, um, Susan B. Komen Foundation. A lot of these organizations, they're, they're front line. They always have their names out in your face. They always have something that they're doing where their name is popular and always in the media. But what you have to do is you should start doing some research if you're going to get information from these people. All of these organizations are million dollar and some of them billion dollar corporations. And so I'll say this same thing that I say about food places, whether they be fast food places, whether they be grocery stores or whether they be restaurants. These people are not in business to make you healthy. These people are in business to make money. And you are the conduit by which they make their money. So when you listen to what the health and they they went to the American Cancer Society, they went to 
the American Diabetes Association. They went to the American Heart Association and they found that not only were their websites giving information that was going against the research that they were looking up, but they also did further research and they found that these organizations were taking millions of dollars from meat companies, from food corporate corporations, and most that should be a conflict of interest is pharmaceutical companies. So again, as long as I have breath in my life, as long as I have the ability to have an opportunity and a platform to give information to people, I am going to try to give the type of information that I see will benefit you not only now, but 30, 40, 50, 60 years down the line, 100 years down the line. And so I want to say just something personally about me quickly. When you finish medical school, you are considered a physician. But in this current state of medicine, you can't practice with a medical license. You can only practice after you go into a residency program where you practice medicine and you have people over you that watch what you do, make sure that what you're doing is safe. And so when I left Nashville, Tennessee, I had already practiced for six months. When I graduated, I graduated in December. I was six months behind. I graduated in December, so I had six months before I started my residency program. And there was a very good doctor in Nashville, Tennessee, in a little outskirts caught in a place called Murfreesboro. And he let me run his practice. I mean, he, I, I started working with him in January on this day, January the 2nd, 1996. So actually today represents my 22nd year of practicing medicine. So you're not listening to a man who hasn't been doing this for a while, 22 years. I've had the experience of practicing traditional medicine. And for the last 13 to 15 years, I've been learning and practicing holistic health. But back to the subject, I practiced six months in this man's office for the first two, maybe three weeks. He was there with me every day. He gained confidence in me. He would be at his farm messing with his animals or doing stuff around his farm. And I was at his practice. I would have to have the nurses call him if I had a problem, but I was practicing medicine right out of medical school, six months. One of the most scary things that happened the first time I ever experienced it, there's this process that happens sometimes when you take people's blood, because you take blood out of the system, they go into kind of this, this reaction because blood was taken out. And this man fainted on me. I thought I had killed him. <laughs> this is like my, my first month in practicing medicine. This man passes out. After I took his blood, I'm sitting there thinking I killed the dude. I'm calling the doctor. Hey, what? And then he started coming back. Had my heart beating so fast, I couldn't believe it. But I'm saying that because I had a, a, a an extreme level of confidence going into my residency program because this man had enough faith to let me work in his office and learn. Unfortunately, when you get to residency program, it's a different climate. These doctors, a lot of them are so egotistical, they don't want you to think your way through the processes. They want you to follow what they do. So to make a long story short, when I started my residency program in 1996 and into 1997, the protocol for a diabetic was to do a urinalysis once a year. That means we check their urine and make sure they don't have protein in their urine. If they have protein in the urine, then you were supposed to start and start this person on an ACE inhibitor. It's a medicine that works on a system in the kidneys. So I looked at that reality and I said, why would I wait until my patient starts to develop some problems from diabetes and then start them on a medicine? Why not start it now to keep them from having the problem? Within about four or five years of me starting that in my patients, it became protocol across medicine. Now, am I saying I'm the one that they got that from? I'm not trying to say that. I don't know if that's true. What I'm saying to you, and I'm using that as an example, is that you're listening to a man that thinks his way through things. I'm not going to present you all with information that I haven't thought about, I haven't contemplated. And most of it, I've, I've either, either experimented on myself or I have a lot of people 
that I suggested that they do it, and I got great results before I would have come and present that to the public. You're listening to a man that's responsible for you. Yes, literally, not responsible just to give you good information, but I feel like I'm responsible for you and your health. That's the way I look at it when it comes to the black community, the brown community, the red community, all the communities. But I'm especially a doctor that was blessed to be where I am to make sure that people that are getting the less and the worst and the least information, they have to have somebody that's their advocate. And that's what I am. I'm an advocate for people so that you have the type of information that not only empowers you, but that you can look in the future and you can be sure that it's going to be a good future. And I gave that example of myself, not for me to get accolades, not for anybody to pat me on the back, but for you to know who you're listening to. So today was day one of the Ultimate Wellness Group on Facebook Live, but I'm going to continue to come back and continue to have programs. And I hope that you will continue to come back. I hope that you interact with me and send me some subjects that you would like me to talk about. Send me questions, send me your comments, because this is for you. I'm not talking about personal medical problems that you need to improve from that. You need to contact me and let's work together. But I'm talking about just in general information where you are trying to improve your lifestyle. This is the place where you can continue to come I'm on Instagram on the Ultimate Wellness Group, where I give, I'm just going to be giving, you know, a little bit of information. I'm on YouTube under the Ultimate Wellness Group, where you can watch videos about your health. I'm going to continue to do this because we need to be empowered so that we will stop falling victim to a thought process that makes us think that we have to die in a short period of time. So next week's program is going to be specifically on this, how to eat to live. And so I want everybody out there that is not in the nation of Islam, doesn't consider yourself a Muslim, that's fine. Come and listen to what I have to say. Listen to my testimony about how to eat to live and how it changed the way I practice medicine. I'm not trying to change your religion. I'm not trying to suggest a religion to you. I'm trying to suggest what I, as a medical scientist, a doctor and a medical scientist, how his life was changed by how to eat to live. And I want you all to know my story so that as we continue to go in the future and continue to have these type of programs, you'll know where my foundation is. You'll know where I am basing my discussion. There's going to be no arguments because I don't get in arguments with people. I'm seeing too many great things happen when people get on the plans that I'm producing for them to have an argument with anybody. I don't need any validity from anybody. There is nobody out there that can validate what I am doing. God validated because this book says what? From God in person. So I don't need any validation from anybody. I don't argue with people. I just try to give information that you can use, news you can use. So I just want to make sure I'm looking at my notes to make sure I covered everything. Oh, it's a couple of things that I found in What the Health that were completely wrong. And that is that sugar does not cause diabetes. That is probably some of the worst information I've heard ever. Now, I do agree that sugar is not as detrimental to the body as meat. Meat, I've been saying for years, is the worst when it comes to production of diabetes. But overconsumption of carbohydrates, overconsumption of sugary foods, sweets, is going to produce diabetes. That is a true fact. Another thing that one of the doctors on, it was the weight loss doctor, what was his name? Um, Dr. Garth Davis on that. Um, what the health documentary, Dr. Garth Davis was the one that was in the weight loss center. And he made a statement that if you eat too much sugar, you store it as glycogen and then you burn most of it off. Well, that is true for the active person. Unfortunately, the minor majority of America is not active. And when you store glycogen, 
there's only so much of a store that you can put in the muscles. It's just like your closet in your house. If you start storing stuff in your closet, eventually it's going to get too full. And then you have to go somewhere else. Well, in the human body, once the storage areas for glycogen, which is in the muscles and in the liver, once they get full, you start converting sugar to fat. And so fat is the main aspect in the human body that starts to take the body in a direction of diabetes. Donald Balaj Muhammad says in How to Eat to Live that fat is a friend to disease. And that's a very, very true statement. I will do a program on overweight and obese people in the future. But just wrap your mind around the reality that if you can stand in, the, in your mirror after you take your shower naked and you have stuff hanging and you got stuff in places that weren't there when you were 19, 20, that is the eventual producer of disease. And so we have to get our lifestyle in the place where we can look in the future and know that we'll continue to be healthy. So I think we are right at about an hour today. Uh, I'm going to have to do some more research on how you all be, will be able to ask me questions and make your comments while we are doing the presentation. But for those of you who tuned in today, I appreciate you. I will be back um, consistently. We'll be doing every Tuesday at three, from three to four, one hour of the Ultimate Wellness Group sharing some information and giving you empowering information so that you can change your life for the better. So today was about what the health. Please share it. Um, please give me your comments if you can. And please come back and uh, tune in next Tuesday where we will be talking about how to eat to live and why I have this as my foundation and why I've had such a great, great experience with this book. And the reason why I say that I used to be a traditional doctor and now I'm a holistic physician is because of this book. This book took me away from a desire to prescribe pills, send people for surgeries, send people to other doctors to do procedures and all these things and started looking at when a person presents themselves to me, why I believe that they can heal their problem. Next week, Tuesday, 3 to 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, How to Eat to Live and My Testimony. Thank you for listening. Hope you all have a wonderful day. Hope your new year begins wonderful and you have a prosperous new year. Peace.